do a marriage retreat, and it seems like every marriage retreat that's new. We are part of the Inner Belt Church, the church that we uh, was planted three years ago. Um, but this is one of the cool things is getting to, to come together in marriage retreats and men's retreats and ladies' retreats. I mean, not ladies, you know, but I don't do that anymore. But um, I'm going to say something kind of unpopular right now. I know everybody's excited about this show, This Is Us, but I think this is a terrible show. <laughs> right? Who's with me? I see some hands over there. It's all guys, and I understand why. <laughs> right? Because it's that show that it's depressing. It's, and, and, you, and you walk into the room, and, and the ladies are watching the show, and they get together to watch the show. And we just weep. We just right? cry. And then you walk into the room and you're like, what is going on here? Right? And then you stop and you start looking. And then you stay. And you, and you sit down. And at the end, I sit down on the back in my, you know, so they don't see on there. You sit down and you're crying with them at the end of it. It's a terrible show. I'm sorry. But I do think it's a great show. It is, it is very sad, but it talks about the story of us. And we have something, we, we got the fun lesson, right? We're going to talk about sin and us. And you're like, oh, no, here it comes, right? Uh, and it's really cool that w what RJ and Ashley were saying before because it really complements what we're going to talk about. About dealing with conflict, sin is one of those that's, that brings the most conflict in our marriages. And we've dealt with those things. And for me, uh, just full disclosure here, uh, before I came to the Crossings Church, I was a Christian. And my life was a complete mess because of sin, because of dealing with, because of having been addicted to pornography for, for so many years, because of being addicted to gaming and to anything that kept me from dealing with myself. And sin destroys, and it destroyed every relationship that I had. And it wasn't until I came to the crossings and started to deal with my sin that things started to change. And the fact that I'm up here at a marriage retreat talking to you guys with this beautiful woman. <laughs> I'm sorry, I want to talk like this, right? Is that better? With this beautiful woman, I, I always think that we both married up. And you're thinking, how does that happen, right? I married this beautiful, intelligent woman who I don't deserve. And she married the old guy. <laughs> That's how she married up. But... Sorry, thanks, guys. It's like, that was our, I, was, I was trying to make that one work, right? But sin, if we don't deal with sin, it's going to destroy our marriages. It's going to destroy the thing that we hold so important. In, uh, according to a 2008 study by Barna, I don't know what Barna is, but it's here. Barna, 50% of Christian couples end up divorced. And that's Christian couples. And the statistics, if, if you're not Christian, I think it's worse. But isn't that crazy that that's, a, that that's a true statistic? And people don't begin by thinking, uh, I just want to fail. Of course they don't. They get into this marriage. Robert is talking about uh, marriage, uh, marriage uh, what is it? When you do counseling before, I'm premarital. Pre I couldn't think of the word, sorry. Uh, when you do premarital is a, a waste of time. Because they're two perfect people that know everything already, and they don't, they don't need anybody to tell them. And that's the problem. We don't plan to fail, but so often we fail because we decide not to listen to God and to others that are trying to help us when, deal with our sins. So I'm going to read a list here of sins, and this is not an exhaustive list. It's not because we don't have enough time. That's right. That's why I have her. She's the organized one. Uh, first thing I'm going to show, we wanted to show you guys is this video. And it's, it's that couple from mood. This Is Us because I don't really watch it, right? Uh, and they're going through some issues. And it's actually after um, what RJ and Ashley showed. They, uh, he ends up going uh, to stay with Miguel, right? Um, I'm not going to tell the rest of it, but he stays Just with watch. Miguel because he was going to go somewhere else to deal with his alcoholism. So this is the, this is the video.
Hi. Hi. So, I was trying to remember myself tonight, Jack. The person I used to be, and then I started remembering you, too. And I'm not the only one who gave up on my dreams, Jack. We both did, right? And we, we realized an even bigger dream, an even more massive dream. And I'm, I'm still really upset, and I don't think I'm ready to talk about any of that yet, but I shouldn't have let you leave. And not just because of all of the beautiful things you said, I shouldn't have let you leave because that's not what we do. That's not who we are, that's not us. I know that, that's not us. I know that I'm not deeply unhappy and I'm not unfulfilled and you're not an alcoholic and you're not your father. And even when I watch Tom Hanks, I sit there and I think to myself, he's not so great. And who does that? Who watches Tom Hanks and thinks, you know what, I'm married to a man that's better than that. Bag, you don't know everything about me. Yes, I do. No, I know Rebecca, everything you don't. I'm drunk you. right now. I have been drunk all day. I have been drunk for weeks. And I thought I had it under control like the first time, but I have a problem, Rebecca. And I've hidden it from you for a very long time. And I've, I've hidden it from my kids. And I need to get a handle on it before I can walk back into that house. I'm sorry. Baby, I... I'm very embarrassed. And I am very sorry. I need to fix this on my own. As I told you, it's terrible. Uh, but what I wanted to do is, is, you know, this sin was hidden. It's a sin that that he didn't want to do. We know that with issues with his father, that's what happened. But guys, this is this is us when we choose not to obey God. And here's a list of sins. And a lot of these are sins that me and my wife have have been guilty of. It says here, watching pornography, cheating on your tax return, being lazy and selfish when you get home after work or on the weekends, enabling the children, spending more time on your phone than with your spouse or your kids, being bitter about sacrificing for God, getting drunk, overindulging in food, TV, video games, envying others, gossiping, being overly insecure, living multiple lives, one at church, another at home, and a completely different one at work. And you fill in the blank of what that is for you. But the problem is that there are consequences to the things that we do. There are consequences that we saw right there. And what we want to do is look first at the consequences, and we're going to go kind of quick on this, and then look what are the problems, what are the things that we do that cause us not to deal with our sin. And then we're going to talk about things that you can do so that your sin, so that you can deal with your sin in a way that you help each other. So and I know you want to hear from my wife more now. So, Yeah, so Ben just listed a bunch of sins, right? And, and I definitely don't want anybody to feel like we're calling them out. But 
honestly, we're, we're calling ourselves out. I definitely want you to know that we're here because this is such a weakness of ours, not because we're free of sin and we're just so phenomenal. It's very the opposite. I mean, Ben talked about his pornography addiction. I myself was addicted to pornography for over a decade, and it dragged into our marriage too, and it was really difficult. And so I just want you to know that if this the list sounded too familiar to you and you are brokenhearted and you're in the midst of the fight right now, I just want you to know that we're here just because of God and that there is so much hope and that there will be a story of redemption if you just hang on and and come along with God. Um, but there are consequences to sin. And there's such a difference between human weakness, right? We, on a daily basis, fail God and fail our spouse. Um, to expect our spouse not to sin is really setting ourselves up for the wrong expectation because I know I sin every day. Um, so there's a stark difference between the sin that we have and then blatantly just live in sin and indulge in sin. Um, one of the consequences is a lack of trust and intimacy. I know when I hide things from Ben, when I know God is tugging at my heart and I'm not listening, I'm not confessing, I can't be in this true innocence and just myself around Ben. Um, last night we talked about Adam and Eve and how when they first got together, there was no shame, there was no hiding, nothing. And when sin entered their life, there was so much shame and blaming. And so the intimacy was completely gone. They covered themselves up um, and had to hide. And remember, the first one of the first things they did was hide from God, as they hid from, from the one that could actually help them. So it's obvious that sin is going to destroy the good things God wants. It says in Proverbs twenty eight thirteen, whoever conceals their sins will not prosper. So another good thing another thing is that that good fruit is not going to happen. We all want good fruit, right? We want our we just talked about parenting great lesson uh from uh from Carrie and Hannah and and we want good kids. But when sin is in our lives, God God can't bless it if we're not close to him. And it's a problem in thinking that I want everything to to be fine when everything is bad. It's naive to think that in the end of this, things are just going to be fine, and, and hopefully I'm not going to have to face the consequences. There are consequences to sin. In John 15, 5, it says, uh, I am the vine and you are the branches. If any, uh, if any remain in me and I remain in them, they will produce much fruit, but without me they can do nothing. That we're not going to be able to change and impact the people in our life, the lost, the people that are around us, if we don't examine our lives and deal with our sin. Um, another consequence is that your children may walk away from Christ because of the hypocrisy that they've seen over the years in your house. Um, 1 Timothy 4.16 says, Be careful in your life and in your teaching. If you continue to live and teach rightly, you will both sa save yourself and those who listen to you. So often I think that my actions will not impact Mia or now Emma. Um, crazy to think I'm mom of two. Um, but they do. They impact. I mean, sh she does the things that I do, and she's barely three years old. Um, and so just to think about that my responsibility is to raise a, a little disciple, and yet I think I can conceal my, my sins from her is, is sheer foolishness. Mm -hmm. And the, the last thing, and this isn't the full list. I mean, we, we could go on and on and talk about consequences of sin. But one of them, and that's the, one of the, I think the main things, is that you and your, your spouse will be on the road to spiritual death because sin is what separates us from God, right? If we don't, if we don't deal with our sin... God isn't able to have a relationship with us. And in Genesis, uh, when it's in Genesis 3, 22 to 3, it was talking about um, what will happen if they eat from the tree, if they disobey God. And God said they will surely die. And then, and then the serpent says, you're not going to die. You know, it's, you're going to be able to be just like God. 
And the problem was that at the end, they didn't realize that this death, the separation from God, was worse than any death that you can have. It's worse. It's the loss of the hope that we have of what God is going to do in our lives and the good things that you want to have. Guys, these consequences are serious. If we don't deal with those consequences, if we don't deal with our sin, these consequences are going to happen. And a lot, how many of you are listen to this list and you're like, I've heard this before, and this is, I understand these are the consequences. How many of you do? Mm-hmm. Right? Several of you are raising your hands because you understand these, these things are true. So why is it that we don't deal with it? And that's what we want to get into now is, um, is why is it that, what are the, thing, the bad things that keep us from dealing with the sin in our lives? And the first one, and, <laughs> you know, and we're talking about dealing with the other person's sin, but I think the main thing here is that we don't take responsibility for the sin in our own life. That when we don't decide to deal with who we are and the things that are in here, that the other person is going to suffer. And there are several reasons for that. That we might desire to, to help our spouse to, do, uh, to get out of their sin and to deal with their sin, and we can see it clearly. But when I'm not dealing with myself, how do I help other people? Right? And one of the first things that we do that can happen is when we feel guilty about your own sin, you're not going to go and tell them. I'd rather just keep my stuff over here under wraps, and I won't say anything about theirs so they don't say anything about mine. Mm -hmm. What kind of a marriage is that when it's more about what you are and not about helping them? Sometimes what we do is you focus on your spouse's sin to distract you from, from having to deal with your own sin. Right? So we focus. Instead of dealing with what's inside, I'm going to look at them and see, look what you do. And I'm going to keep my stuff in here. That way I don't have to think about this other thing. And sometimes sometimes we think our, our spouse's sin is just, just worse than ours. Isn't that one thing that we do? Is that, oh, yeah, they're, they're terrible. Look what they do. But the truth with sin is that when we don't deal uh, that. All sin is the same, and we don't feel like that in our marriage, right? We want to we wanna make those, oh, yeah, you're worse than I, than I am. I'm glad I'm not like him, right? I'm married up, right? And it's like, uh, I'm, or I, I'm married below, and he's, he's down there. But it's all about not dealing with who we are. In Matthew 7, verse 5, it says, You hypocrite, first take the plank out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. So the first thing isn't pointing the finger at somebody else. It's going, okay, what are the things in my life, the sins in my life that I haven't dealt with? And so often I've been, I've been <laughs> responsible and the person who did all those things I just talked to you about, that I didn't want to deal with theirs because I didn't want to deal with mine. Another thing that keeps in in your marriage is because you are an enabler and you are looking at one. Um, Remember the scene when Rebecca opened the door and said, Jack, you are not an alcoholic. You're not your father. You're not this. You're not that. And he looks back at her and said, I've been lying to you. I've been a drunk. I've been drinking. I've hidden it from you. I've hidden it from your kids. And wow, that. I, I cried through that because of the, a lot of that is me. I'm Rebecca. I don't want to see the wrong. I don't want to see failure um, in our marriage because then that means that not just my spouse is bad, but my gosh, I have responsibility too, and I have been wrong. Um, so a couple weeks ago, no, no, a couple months ago, my timeline is a little thrown off. I just had a baby. <laughs> um Several leaders of our church confronted Ben and talked to him about his pride and his control issues. And instead of being on board with my friends who I know love him and love us and our family, my gosh, I isolated us and I said, no, what's wrong with them? You're great. I mean, you're awesome. And there's nothing wrong with us and there's nothing wrong at all. And there was so much anger in me and 
my poor friends had to wheel me back and say, what are you doing? Why are you not talking to us? Why are you making, why are you isolating yourself? Why are you completely just staying in denial and being defensive when there are others that deeply care about you and are trying to help you? And, um, mm. and, and what it is is that you get, you get defensive and prideful. That you're not going to talk about, <laughs> you're not going to talk about my spouse or say this thing about him, or because it's us, right? And then that us becomes this this toxic relationship that nobody can help, because each one enables the other. And when you do that, you keep yourselves far away from the ones that are going to be able to help. I remember in the middle of it when she got mad, I was mad. Okay, I was mad, and who are they to tell me, right? I'm the preacher of this church, and. And, uh, you know, all those, that pride comes up, and you, and you, and you feel this way. And, and the truth was, in the middle of that, I heard her getting angry at them. And at the same time, I was like, wait a minute, you're, you, no, say, tell me I'm wrong. <laughs> you know, not that I'm perfect, but the thing, tell me that I'm wrong, because I knew in, the, in my anger that that wasn't right. And when you enable each other, you don't help to get, to get it resolved. And sometimes the enabling is because you like feeling superior next to the one that screws up all the time. You know that feeling? Oh, yeah, I'm with, I'm with idiot right here, <laughs> right? And everybody knows and everybody sees it and it's common knowledge. And what do, you, what do they think of you? Yeah, poor thing. <laughs> you're right. Right? It's, the, it's that idea of you're, you're the victim, in this relationship that, oh, why is she still in there? Why does she do that? I know, yes, I, I need to get out of this. But she will never get out of it because she knows how to deal with that situation. And if she goes out, then she might have to deal with herself. And you see it so many times in people who get better from addiction. So often, the, the, sometimes the relationship is destroyed because the other person was with them because she knew how to deal with that addiction. And, and that's what kept them together. Isn't that sad? That's called enabling. I was talking to Robert and asking some things to him about it, and he, and he came up with this example of, a, of cops when they are called to, to a domestic violence, to deal with domestic violence. You know that cops hate that? You know why? Because when they get there, the spouse will turn on the cop. Mm-hmm. That you're not going to do this. You're not going to confront, and we're, we're perfect. There's no problem. Are you honest with where, the, where your relationship is? Are you enabling the other person and the things that they do so that everybody sees maybe that you're perfect or that you stay in your situation, that you're a victim? Because, because you think that's the best. Another reason we keep sin in our marriage is that um, we care more about our comfort than the uh, spiritual life of our spouse. Um, so as much as I dislike confrontation, I come from a home where confrontation came with punishment and shame and it was, it was just terrible. Um, but on the other side, when it's about my comfort, then all of a sudden I can confront Ben all the time. I mean, when the dishes aren't done, when he's not on time, when the electric bill isn't getting paid, I am on his case. I mean, I am talking to him all the time. Yeah. I go over my budget once a week. And crumbs. Oh, my goodness. It's like I don't like crumbs. It's a pet peeve. <laughs> and he's a crumb monster. <laughs> Him and Mia love That's crumbs. That's not true. I just wear tennis shoes all the time, so I don't know where they come from. His favorite anyway. bagel is the everything bagel and the sesame seeds on everything. And it's all over the it's counter. It's the best bagel, right, Matt? It's like, oh, we know. <laughs> Drives me crazy. So you get the picture. I mean, I am on his case. But when it's about godly things, like whether or not he spends time with the guys in his ministry and is really intimate with them and is talking to them, or whether or not he has been praying for the church or um, has been spending time with God, I don't ask him that oft- often enough. Uh, my mind is, hey, what's, what's benefiting Zhang instead of what is benefiting God and what will glorify God? Um, So us girls talk, right? 
And I know a lot of times we sit together and we talk about, well, how, how are things in your marriage? And we're like, yeah, so the romance is kind of gone. And I have to set up all the dates. And I'm constantly looking for the babysitter. And it's kind of sad because I had to confess to Ben, you know, I don't really get together with my girls and pray for our husbands. Instead, we just talk about the things that we're missing and the comforts we're missing. And we don't spend enough time talking about what would actually help our spouse to have a better relationship with God. And I think the my biggest failure, failure is not pushing Ben enough, I think, in, in wanting him to be a leader of our house because so many times I enjoy being in control. And I know a lot of the girls and I talk about that, how, how we enjoy being the superior one and being in control versus helping our spouses to be the leaders. And, and, you might, and all this sounds really terrible, right? <laughs> it sounds like, who are these people, right? They're, ter- they're terrible people. And, but I hope that in some of these things you're seeing yourself, in a lot of these things I've seen myself, doing these things instead of looking at her and saying look you uh, i haven't seen you have your quiet time in a while or i haven't seen you pray or or take out the bible it's more about like you you didn't you haven't made dinners like or, or, or things like that and things that are my comfort and guys you know what that is all this stuff that we've been talking about rj and ashley were saying it's selfishness it's all rooted in i want what i want in this marriage It was never about, uh, I want to serve the other person, which is what God wants us to do. And if we don't learn that we need to serve our spouse and help them, we're not going to help them with their sins. So what are some things that we can do? How do we help each other through sin? And one of the first things, guys, is that it's not about me. Okay? It's not about me. It's not about us. It's about God. When we decide to put God at the center of our marriage, that's when we have a different approach on how we deal with sin and how we do we confront and how we deal with the conflict in our lives. Right. It's what Robert was saying when he asked you to to talk about you and who you are. Right. What is what is the story of you? Right. What is this is us? Is it really about God or is it about what I want to get in the marriage? And of course, (laughs) Of course, we put all the per- – I'm sure you, when you were wrote that, writing it down, you might be kind of guilty. You know, it's like, oh, what is it, right? Do I, do I know what it is, right? When she asks, what are the things that you love about me? And he's like, he can't – he's choking it because he can't say it, right? It's like, what is it that is really important? So it's about God. The second thing is we need to love the sinner and hate the sin. Because so often what happens is we're so mad at what the other person is doing that we forget how much we love them. You are human beings, and you're going to have issues in your marriage. There is no marriage here, and because there's no marriage that is perfect. We know that, that we're going to have issues, that we're going to sin. Are you going to be able to help each other? You know when we need each other the most? Is when we sin. But you know what Satan convinces us to do? You know what? (laughs) I'm not going to talk to you anymore. Right? You need to deal with yourself. You need to go. And hear what happened with, he had to go to Miguel's house to deal with his sin? Really? When did he need her the most to be there with, to be there with him and help him through this, through the alcoholism he was going through, the the feelings and stuff? In Galatians 6, 2, um, in Galatians 6, 2, it says, carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. As a, as a couple, do you know that's what you're doing? That you're helping each other carry your burdens, the things that, that your weaknesses, the, the things that are hard to deal with. Make sure that the person isn't alone when they need you the most and love the sinner but hate the sin. Um, oh, I continue here, sorry. <laughs> um, another thing is that we each, sorry, that we become the spouse that they need and not the spouse that they want. 
Because a lot of times that's what we're trying to do is trying to tweak this thing so we're exactly how they want it and I'm going to dress a certain way and this and there's nothing wrong with that. But often when it comes the point that where we need to confront the other person, do we do it or do we want to just keep everything okay so that we don't, <laughs> we don't stir, stir things up and, and make it worse? If you're going to love your spouse you're going to have to confront them and tell them some hard things. You know when I love my, life, my wife the most, and I, I know it, and you're going to say you're lying, but it's when she confronts me. And it's not in that moment when I'm being confronted. Nobody likes that moment, right? Like when somebody comes and tells you, look what you're doing. But when she loves me enough to come and tell me, Ben, I, hadn't seen, I haven't seen you do this with your guys, or you haven't been very vulnerable or I notice that you're doing this or this or this. She's loving me. And being the spouse that I need, the one that's going to help me to do the things that God wants me to do. So sometimes we need to confront, even when it's scary or out of our comfort, comfort zone. Guys, we understand discipline isn't comfortable, but it's what is going to help us to have the spouse that we actually want. The one that, that you hoped for. It says in 1 John 4.18, it says, There is no fear in love, but love drives out, drives out fear. Make sure you love your spouse fearlessly. Not cowered away in this corner that if I say something, they're going to shout at me. What if they do shout at you? But the result of it is that you have a marriage that's godly, and that that person is going to, to grow. And we're, we're kind of at the end here, but it says, but we need to make it about the things that are godly, not about what you want. Remember, it's about selfishness, right? This is, this is why we don't deal with sin. Make it about things that are godly, about their time with God, their time in prayer, their time in ministry, their time in leading the family and reaching out to others and spending time with God's word and God's people. These are the things that produce the fruits of the Spirit, the things that are going to, like I said, are going to make your husband or wife into the person that you really want. And to end it, in Ephesians in Ephesians 5, starting in verse 25, and you know this passage, it says, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy cleansing her by the washing with water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless, blameless. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated his own body, but he feeds and cares for it just as Christ does the church, for we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become, the f will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I am talking about Christ and the church. And then this is, it's, it's a profound mystery. I'm talking about, weren't we talking about husbands, and what, how did it get Christ and the church in the middle of this? But the truth, what our responsibilities are, your role as a spouse, is to make sure that when your husband or, wi or wife meets their maker, that they, that they are holy and blameless. And I didn't get this from myself. This was Francis Chan. I know you're thinking, oh, I read that book. You're right, <laughs> right? That he said that our responsibility is to make sure, is for me to look at Zung and think the last thing I would want is for her to get to, to God on that last day and think, and he say, wait a minute, what about these sins you didn't deal with? What about this? That, you, that was rampant in your life. And I'm sure you don't want that for your wife or husband, but it's going to take work to do it. It's going to take you doing it together and being the people you need to be so that at the end, I can come to God and present her as holy and blameless. Wouldn't that be incredible to get to do that? And it's not only about you two, it's about your kids, it's about the people that are around you. One thing, when we got married, and I, I was 36 when I got married. I wasn't sure I was going to be able to get married. I was getting old, right? <laughs> Zung never thought she would get married because of who her parents were and the relationship that they had. 
So when we got married, it was about God because we met at the at the church and got together in the campus ministry. And, you know, she accepted the old guy, you know, and like, right. But it can get lost. What we do, we want to do for God and for our marriage to bless that. And I want to show you the, the last clip here. Like it's a little the end of it that some of you know what happens at the end, but. Get in the car. Get in the car, Jack. You are my husband. And I am your wife, and if you have a problem, we will fix it together. I just need you to get in the car so we can go home. <gasps> ah, there you go. And I, I love this scene so much because she realizes her role her job, her J-O-B, is, is to bring her husband back home, right? And there will be no one else to do that for him. And I know it's not a Christian show, but for us, home is eternity. And I know I don't think about that often enough. But if you are not bringing your spouse home, then who else is going to do it? So just think about that. Let's pray. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for for the God that you are that you bring broken people together and that you're able to do something with them. Lord, I, I don't understand sometimes why I get to, to talk in at the places I do and, and to be hope to people when I come from a place of no hope. But it's because of who you are. It's not because of us, but you make us so much better. Lord, thank you so much for your son who came and who, who looked at us as people who are worth it that even though we didn't deserve it, that he saw something in us because of the love that he has, because of the grace that he has, Lord. Lord, I hope that that in the end that I am able to present my wife as holy and blameless and that we're able to have a marriage that influences others and that we deal with our sins so that others can can relate and understand that you can do it together, Lord. Thank you so much for your son and the sacrifice that he made for us. It's in his name we pray. Amen.